You kind of, you like, you roll your eyes when you hear, especially in Sira, when again and again you hear a cut and paste job and you hear the same mistakes without analysis. Mm -hmm. And then you're thinking, you're thinking, yes, in a coffee house, like in a mosque or when you're giving these talks to people hundreds of years ago, six, seven, eight hundred years ago, you're arousing the crowds. No one's going to challenge you. But today your books are out in the West and people are picking apart each of your arguments and unfortunately Muslims haven't honed their history. Another problem is is that the seerah is taught in the uh, it's taught from English books so once you're translating you're getting a book you know many people use uh, the sealed nectar which is a book that uh, I really wouldn't recommend and I really don't even like that book and I'll talk about that why in a bit and then there are other books that people use as well Martin Ling's book is a good book but there's problems with that as well uh, and then the problem is is that once you're teaching through English right that text is fixed it's already been translated and it's fixed so you can no longer analyze that text and derive anything further from that text and if you try to derive something from that text it's going to take you more off the path if you want to do an analysis you have to look at the original text and as you're teaching teaching the seerah you'll have to you have to analyze the seerah point by point and pick it apart and get people's understanding and get proper engagement from them. There's no engagement. Even in a Sira class, there's no engagement. Unfortunately, the teachers who teach the Sira get many parts wrong. Another argument I heard a prominent person say is, how do you know a nine-year-old? How do you know? Uh, uh, Zakir Naik actually said this. I mean, I'm not going to mention any more names. This is just one name. Uh, Zakir Naik says, how do you know that she wasn't mature enough to make that decision that he was the right man for her? No nine-year-old has that agency. Um, I've always been interested in history from a young age. I've always loved to learn about various cultures, uh, the history of those cultures, why certain events took place and why we ended up where we are today. And as a result of that, I, I love to travel. So Alhamdulillah, Allah gave me the opportunity to travel to you know, many countries and I got to fulfill my dreams in, in travel as well. And that gave me a deeper insight into uh, cultures. And there's one thing about reading cultures and history from a book. And then there's another thing of actually experiencing it when you're there with them. So, you know, that gives you a deeper understanding of how to critically analyze history. And even though I'm a graduate of history, I wouldn't really say that, that you know, some people go through three years of university not really benefiting. So I went through th three years of university. Yes, we learned about, you know, the, the Protestant movement. We learned about uh, Saddam Hussein, Middle East. We learned about the Crusades and, you know, the various topics, the the, the history of medicine and, and things like Renaissance and things like that. But I would say that the most, the only tools that I really came away with from my history degree was how to analyze history. Apart from that, most of it's been my own research prior to university and then obviously as a hobby after university as well so i wouldn't really say it was it was university that equipped me with everything that i know it's my, it was my own reading and my own um wanting to get a penetrating insight into the how and the why of when you read because if you you can read two ways you can read and just skim through everything and say oh interesting this is what happened and then certain things are very jarring they don't fit they don't make sense and then you, you know you're forced to question this doesn't feel right as I want to get to the bottom of this. If I can't get to the bottom of this, I'm not going to sleep. So then it forces you to open more books, look at more resources, understand the statements of scholars, and then pick them apart. And then, you know, in the early, early stages, you're handicapped in following those scholars. But then as you mature, you say, hang on a minute, you know, I admire you, you're, 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 you're the crown of your particular subject in your field. You're recognized. Everybody sits at your feet. But I don't feel comfortable with this. And I have the same tools that I've learned from you. So I'm going to now analyze you and I'm going to make my own reasoning. And I think with history, you can do that because there's no wrong and right. So you can you can formulate the nuances yourself in history. You're perfectly right. I think with history, and one of the reasons why I've kind of put all my effort behind history, uh, although I've studied all the Islamic uh, sciences to a very minimal level. I'm not going to push myself forward there. But I feel that with history, there is an agency that every person can take for themselves. When you read history, there is a, uh, you can say, a duty to actually do due diligence. 
it's not sufficient just to read. If you read in the books yes. of fiqh, it's sufficient. You've read the hukum, you follow it. If you understand the basis, you follow it. If you read uh, books on creed and theology, you, it's sufficient to read it, to understand it, mm -hmm. and just to accept it. You don't have to go beyond that, right? And in fact, it's almost discouraged to try to go beyond that, right? To use the reasoning and certain levels. Yes, yes. But with history, it's insufficient just to read the akhbar and say, I've read it. Right? You have to go beyond that. And I think it's a feel that the common Muslim or the common individual has, uh, there is a space to explore, to exercise critical thinking. And in fact, that's when history becomes interesting, you know? Yes. So I think it's, it's the perfect spot for those of us who are inquisitive, but also as you've mentioned, because it's, 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 a, it's a process of actually not only learning the information, but learning the tools by which you can go on and do your own analysis, right? So what you learn at, at university is effectively like a training. It's a preliminary stage, but it isn't everything because you don't come out thinking, I know everything about history gives you basic principles. If you utilize them properly, you can achieve a lot. Uh, evidently, as we discussed the other day when we had a very mm -hmm. interesting discussion. I mean, the two, two things come to mind. Like, like you, you get intuition. So sometimes you, you, you'll come across some information and you don't even need to analyze it deeply. And your first intuition is this doesn't feel right. This doesn't sound right. And then when you test your hypothesis, it's correct. So I'll give you one example. <clears throat> Everybody knows when Genghis Khan, when he invaded in uh, was it 1221 when he invaded Otra and the Khwarizm Empire when he got to Bukhara there's that famous statement that he uttered everybody uses it he went to the Grand Mosque in Otra sat on the pulpit and said what he says I am the vengeance of God right uh, uh, come to punish you for your sins now Genghis Khan who came from the furthest barbarian Mongolian steppe areas who was probably Buddhist Probably, you know, obviously Tengri, he believed in Tengri. He, he yes. was a shamanistic kind of a religion. You know, for you to invade a land and very quickly learn out what Muslims believe in. <laughs> you know, to know that they believe in a one God, they believe in a heaven and a hell. And that, that you know, Allah sometimes punishes you for your sins in this world. That's, that's not possible. That was a later addition that Muslims put as an embellishment that, to, to interpret what happened to them. Mm. Right, so you you get a feel for these things, and then you you kind of you like you roll your eyes when you hear, especially in Sira, when again and again you hear a cut and paste job, and you hear the same mistakes without analysis, mm -hmm. and then you're thinking you're thinking yes, in a coffee house or in um, like in a mosque or when you're giving these talks to people hundreds of years ago, six, seven, eight hundred years ago, you're rousing the crowds. No one's going to challenge you, but today your books are out in the West. And people are picking apart each of your arguments. And unfortunately, Muslims don't have answers, no matter how much they would like to think they have answers. Yes, you can have an answer in theology because you've honed that skill for 1400 years. You'll have an answer in Asul of your particular school, but Muslims haven't honed their history. So there's a gaping hole and, and they don't have the answers. And has this, you mentioned so many interesting things here. Uh, the, anach the anachronistic tendencies when we tell history from the future. So we know already the trajectory of what happened. We know generally the narrative that we want to uh, convey. And therefore we kind of almost, we uh, uh, we place characters in the right part of the script. So Genghis Khan talking of being a scourge of God on, onto the believers because of their sins, it fits a narrative. The grand narrative oh, is yeah. because we've been so decadent, we've been so disobedient, Allah has punished us through somebody else. So. There is that anachronistic perspective when you look back. And you're right, when you look at certain, uh, so for example, when you mentioned the Sira, I look at certain early instances pre-Islam where certain events almost indicates that the people knew that something was about to happen. Okay, But in the way it's written, in the way it's conveyed, it's almost, you almost ask yourself, if you knew it's coming, why did you not accept it when it came? Or exactly. it's just too perfectly yeah. done. And I remember mentioning it one uh, when we discussed it the other day that some of the poetry you disagreed a bit on this one, but I believe the poetry, especially uh, just impromptu poetry, it is a bit too elaborate. But also, who would re who would remember every piece of the poem to then be able to convey it in such intricate detail in the books of history? And so that gives you reason to question and to ask yourself how much of that narrative 
is later addition for embellishment. It doesn't have to be falsification, but embellishment just to kind of, uh, you could almost say, uh, yeah, to embellish, right? The story and the plot. Beautiful. And how much of it, yeah, the beautiful, it. Exactly, that's it, adorn it, exactly, that's a better word. And how much of, of it then is a kernel of truth? And as we know, Sira is not a science, as fiqh is a science, or sharia, or any, or any of those derivatives of sciences. It's not a science. And so there are many questions in Sira, for example, that uh, remain unresolved, in a sense, so yes. the age of certain companions, the age of Khadija, the age. Yes. there are so many divergent positions on these things that you cannot really say this is the answer. And so mm -hmm. it kind of gives you a, I think for me, it's not, it's not a problem. It's just an opportunity to kind of explore. Let's look at the different perspectives then in this side of things. But I want to ask you, Brother Amir, do you think Sira is being taught adequately, given what we've just mentioned now? Is it being taught adequately? Because the way I've seen Sira being taught typically in the West, from my experience, is we have like a 10-week course, maybe a Ramadan course, and we go across the main highlights of the Sira in a very formulaic, very, it's the same thing. It's pretty much the same thing everywhere. I feel personally there is a, there's a depth that we're not piercing when it comes to Sira. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Do you feel that's being taught adequately in your experience? Or what are your kind of, uh, what's your view on that? Well, a very telling statement would be the statement coming from Ali ibn Hassan ibn Ali, who is the grandson of Sayyidina Ali Karamallahu Waj. He says, we were taught Sira in a house just as we were taught Quran. So Quran is taught in a very intense way. You know, the Quran is your constant companion through life, and it's not a surface level engagement with Quran. If you're going to study Quran properly, it's a lifelong endeavor and it's a deep engagement. And they would be taught Sira in the same way. So Sira wasn't taught as a story. Sira was analyzed for all its components. You know, Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the father, Muhammad, the husband, Muhammad, the, the son, Muhammad, the companion, Muhammad, the brother, the statesman, all of these things. And we're far removed from that. Our, our Sira, the way we're taught Sira today is a surface level uh, it's not even an engagement. I wouldn't even say surface level engagement. It's a surface level skim. So yeah, you're right that these courses that you're talking about, primarily the me the method of Sira teaching is through lectures. So you'll have like like a fifty part lecture or a three month course, or you'll watch a YouTube series, a hundred part series, and you're basically going through the main events. And most of those events are action-laden events that happened in the life of Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, you know, the interesting part. So you've missed, you've missed 90% of the spirituality, 90% of the nuances, the analysis you've missed. So you're never going to go through that. You're going to come away thinking, yes, you're going to shed tears. You're going to get a deep engagement with the Prophet. You're going to, you're going to attempt, you're going to feel like you've understood the Prophet uh, at a deeper level. Not really. You've only understood, you only connected with story you know whatever's in that story whether it's 10 percent of the seed or 50 percent, that's your connection and that's your love how much of it are you going to implement in your life after that probably nothing and then the feeling the emotional feeling goes another problem is is that the seed is taught in the uh, it's taught from english books so once you're translating you're getting a book you know many people use uh, the sealed nectar which is a book that uh, i really wouldn't recommend and I really don't even like that book and I'll talk about that why in a bit and then there are other books that people use as well Martin Ling's book is a good book but there's problems with that as well uh, and then the problem is is that once you're teaching through English right that text is fixed it's already been translated and it's fixed <laughs> so you can no longer analyze that text and derive anything further from that text and if you try to derive something from that text it's going to take you more off the path Right. Mm -hmm. So prim prim primarily, if you want to do an analysis, you have to look at the original text. And as you're teaching, teaching the Sira, you'll have to you have to analyze the Sira point by point and pick it apart and get people's understanding and get proper engagement from them. There's no engagement. Even in a Sira class, there's no engagement. There's only like a like a token engagement, which is not how, how, how you learn Sira. Right. And another problem is, is unfortunately, the teachers who teach the Sira get many parts wrong. They can't answer many questions. I'll give you an example. So the 
the age the age of uh, Sayyidatuna Aisha right. she married she 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 married at the cusp of puberty she came to live with the Rasul uh, past puberty now no, I've never seen anybody explain that I mean I've heard some ridiculous things girls in the desert hit puberty earlier because of the right? hate yeah subhanallah yani this is this is not an argument another argument I heard a prominent person say is how do you know a nine year old how do you know uh, uh, Zakir Naik actually said this. I mean, I'm not going to mention any more names. This is just one name. Uh, Zakir Naik says, how do you know that she wasn't mature enough to make that decision that he was the right man for her? No nine-year-old has that agency, right? So that's a very weak argument as well. They couldn't give the argument in its anthropological context. The age of Khatija, Khatija Tukubra, she's, um, she, they say she was 40, Right. With bad nutrition in a desert environment, tough living, a woman at the cusp of menopause, how did she give Rasul six, seven children, one after the other? Right? This is, you know, something very, that, very Sorry, let me, let me just stop you there. I never thought of that point, actually, as you mentioned, because there were six, seven children, right? <clears throat> so mm. when you factor that into, even in modern day conditions, mm. In some of the most advanced in terms of material amenities and resource laden nations, that is extraordinary actually. When you think when you just take that biological imperative, 47 children later, but you're taking it back to the uh, to the ancient Arab desert society, that is questionable. From a biological is... perspective, if you look at biology, biology at the age of 40, you can exit your exit almost as they say, depleted or a bit less geriatric. So just on that level, it kind of really opens up certain doors. Wait a second, we didn't think of this before. So that's an interesting point you've mentioned, actually. But we'll continue going, sorry, I just wanted to, that was an interesting um, point. And then, and then uh, when Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam first, no, no. this is when they start making the big blunders now. This is when the really big blunders come. So when Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam first uh, oh, received his first revelation, you know, so then the way they interpret that story, they will have you believe that Rasul came away from that experience terrified, right? That's a very bad choice of word. Very, very bad choice of word. Then the understanding of when 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 the angel said to uh, Rasul Sallallahu Ikra, and he said, Ma'ana bikari, like I'm not a reciter, right? Now, what is the meaning of that? Why did that happen three times? And what was the meaning of that the significance of that what was the meaning of the the, um, the hugging right i've never seen any book i've never seen any talk justifiably explain that right and then when he comes away and he goes home they say he go he went home in terror to his wife actually no if you read the classical narratives they don't say he went home in terror it was it was a case of where he knew and now here's an interesting point remember the prophets have isma which means that they they're free from error they're sharp in focus, and you don't need to repeat things to them many times. So Rasul was aware know. was aware more than any other man at that time, if any other man had been there, that this was prophecy. He knew exactly what was going on. He, if you read the classical narratives, he wasn't terrified. He was shaking because of a of the overwhelming event that had just happened. You know, it's like man has th there's always a veil between this world and the next world. Right? And now that barrier has been momentarily opened and you've connected. Man, with his biological limitations, has connected with the unseen world, the spiritual world. Right? And a normal man could not bear that. But the Rasul Sallallahu he bore that. And are you telling, him, telling me he's not going to come away shaking? And when he said, I fear for myself that some, yeah, I fear this is where they get problems in the wordings. If you analyze this properly, you'll see he wasn't fearing for himself that he's possessed. He was fearing as in the burden has hit me now. Will I be able to fulfill this task? I fear that I, how am I going to do this? Now, when all of a sudden God says, I've tasked you to do this. Are you not going to think, oh my God, am I ready? Oh my God, I'm scared. How am I going to do this? Right? From the, from and the then, burden. Yeah, of the burden on his shoulders now. And then the second problem that comes very straight after is they happen to have people believe that it was Khatija that calmed him down and said, come to me to my Christian cousin, Waraka ibn Nawfal, and he will affirm, he will affirm and tell you who, whether you're a prophet or not. Subhanallah. 
So now here's, here's a problem straight away. The Christian is going to pick up on this and say, oh, right. So he was already living with a Christian. You know, they, they, they're chasing after the wrong the wrong thing here because they would most people who teach Sira, because it's all cut and paste, they would have you believe that that story of Bahira the monk is problematic. Right? That's, but a, you've that's, got a, a, common, that's a common... Uh... That is a common uh, subject raised about the authenticity of yeah, the encounter. Yeah, I don't, I don't find that problematic, and obviously because I've done my research on that one. But they would have you believe that that's problematic. But then, if you're going to use the same logic to say it's problematic, Bahira is a Christian living in the vicinity of Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The Christians can Christians can say not only did he teach him him the religion, but he actually had to tell him you're a prophet. Now, here's two problems with this. A Christian had to tell Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, no, it's okay, calm down. This is the Namus, this is the angel Gabriel that we know about that's come to you. So I'm the first to verify you are a prophet, right? Okay, let's go with this narrative. Let's say this is exactly what happened. Then why don't you say that the very first Muslim, you, then you have to say Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam didn't believe. He was, he was hesitant. He was doubtful. His wife was the first believer. She convinced him. She took him to Baraka ibn Nawfal. He reinforced the belief. So he is now the second Muslim. So why in our narratives do we have that Abu Bakr as-Siddiq is the first one, or Sayyidina Ali, or Zayd ibn Harith? You see what I'm trying to say here now? The first man would be Sayyidina Abu Bakr. But how? But how? How? When? If Baraka ibn Nawfal. Yeah, this is what I mean. This is these are these are problems, right? Th these are people don't look at these things. You have to and you can't just whoosh, okay, I'm enjoying the story. Yeah, I'm reading Sira, man. Yeah. No, you have to analyze uh, properly and get the true meaning, meaning of what you're studying here. It's not a joke. You're studying the Sira of Rasul. You can't afford to make mistakes. And this is where I think the point one of the points that you're making here that I think is worth again further pursuing is the, the idea that you can study it in a language other than the language in which was native to the people who wrote the books. So if you look at, uh, look at Ibn Ishaq or Ibn Hisham, these are Arabic books. And of course, they furnish far more details and far more material to work with than the translation, as you mentioned, and you've eloquently described as being fixed. It's mm -hmm. almost like I've given you like a molding that's already been fixed. You will you won't be able to do anything with that because it's already fixed, right? It's not malleable yes. anymore. So mm -hmm. when reading the Sira in English, certainly there will be certain elements that are not going to be included. So for example, many of the uh Sierra or Sira books are either abridged or they're revised or they're on top of being translated. So it's almost like all the nutrients have been taken away. And you've got a shell of something that really is a profound it's a profound subject that has so much more. However, mm. being limited by the translation, it makes it difficult. But it's not impossible. So I think my question now is, okay, let's assume somebody does not have the Arabic language as a tool, as a medium to reach the wider narrative. What else can they grab onto to help them kind of get a, a, a bit of a deeper perspective on Sira? Because you've mentioned... So you mean, you mean how the everyday person, the everyday person who wants to engage himself with the biography of Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, how in English. go about it, right? In English, in English, yes. Right, so from my experience of teaching Sira, uh, I, I would say, pick a book, like, first of all, get yourself into a course, or as you decide to read the Sira, keep in mind that you need, you need to raise questions for yourself, and then you need to be able to find someone who you can speak with to get answers. Because some of, some of the questions that are going to be raised, you know, you're going to find very thorny and then you're going to, you're going to think, um, I don't understand this. And um, you're going to start having bad feelings about maybe Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi or what was going on at that time, because you're, con because contextually you're far removed from there. Right. So you don't have the, the proper, the, the historical background or the, the actual, um, you know, like you don't know about tribalism or, or war, how war was conducted or slavery, or child marriages. So you're going to look at all of these things in a, with a modern lens, and you're going to have a big problem. So yeah. always be ready for this. And the way to tackle it is, is it's a good question, actually, because Sira, Sara Yesiru. Sara means to move, to make a journey. Yesiru and Sira. So it's a journey. 
You're moving from A to B and every journey is made with a purpose. No journey is made aimlessly, right? So you're moving from A to B and a journey, you're making a journey with whom? The greatest of creation, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, right? So, and that means you become his companion, right? So to become his companion, you need to observe him, right? So you have to observe everything. The seerah is not going to give you that. The seerah is a framework, right? So read the seerah. Read the seerah from beginning to end and don't read one seerah. Read as many different versions as you can. Because even in the English, you're going to find differences. And avoid the books that people tell you to avoid. There's good reason for that, which we'll get into, you know, inshallah, if we, get, if we have time. Read it from beginning to end. And as you read each chapter, use another, you know, like have a different book and read the same chapter. Have a different book, three, four, five versions and read one chapter before you move on. Once you've done that completely, that's your first read. Right. Remember, we said, Sira, you're on a journey and it's a lifelong journey. Right. You're moving with the messenger of Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So then you need to take a deeper dive. So a deeper dive would be straight away. You read a deeper version of, of Sira. You get them. Most of them are in the Arabic languages, one or two in the English language as well. If you don't have them, then you read things like uh, Nur al-Ayyum. Right? Yeah, that's a very, that's a very... Uh... Very simple, like Muhtasar is like a primer, isn't yes, it? Yes, yes. Very condensed, yes. yeah. Yes, yes. But it's telling you, see, what, what it's telling you in there, the Sira is not going to tell you in detail, right? Mm -hmm. And then you've got like books like uh, Ash-Shifa Ba Qadi Iyad, which yes. teaches you Allah's relationship with the Messenger of Allah, Salam, and it gives you beautiful examples that you will find nowhere else. The Sira don't cover those. It would never cover those. You know, it, it's, it's, he's mentioning Quranic verses and the ex exquisite choice of wording Allah use when he's talking to Rasul, Salam. And that's, that's, that's Allah's relationship. That's not, it's not the messenger's relationship with Allah. You'll see that in the Sira, but it's Allah's relationship with Rasul. Then so, there's the Shema'il, right, by uh, Shema'il by Tirmidhi, where you learn the, the finer points and the details. And then, for example, read his relationship with his wives, how many wives he had. His relationship, th that's your second and third dive, right? So that's how I would tackle Sira. And also, I would tackle a bit of the, the, the prehistory of it as well. So you only really need about 150 years prior to the advent of the birth of Rasul Sallallahu Give us a recommendation for those who are beginning this journey. Where should they begin in the English language? Which resources, which books you, would you recommend for them to begin with um, as they delve into this uh, amazing journey? Right, so four books come to mind. And like I have in my collection probably about 20, 30 books. And uh, the the video series, you know, across the whole spectrum on YouTube, I've got them all as well for my own personal research purposes. So books wise, out of all of them, the there's a, there's a the preeminent book I would say is Martin Ling's. Why? Because of the extreme amount of reverence and love, and uh, and and the the high level of language he uses, which is befitting of a seerah. And for the most part, it's true to Ibn Hisham. He doesn't shy away from one or two controversial issues. He's mentioned them like they are. Sure. But the only weakness in his seerah is that because he's a scholar of the English literature, of English like literature, Shakespeare yeah. specifically, uh, he doesn't he he can't analyze the way a historian would analyze, right? So there's number one, there's no analysis, and number two is certain things he 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 tried to, but he, he, he yeah, it, it just doesn't work. So he's ended up putting stories in there that really you shouldn't have put in there because there was no reason to put them in there because they're not even true, true or they're controversial. And that wasn't the space for it in your limited book. That that's one. Another one is there's a there's a, an English author called uh, Barnaby, something Barnaby, right? He's wrote two very good books. One he's wrote Muhammad, uh, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and the other one he's wrote. The, the four companions. So the, immediately after the Sussan the, the first the first four. No, he wrote it's called it's called the House of the Prophet or something. It's to do with the the the, the early the Ahlul Bayt and uh, the the four companions and the, the Sunni Shia split and then the, the early invasions. So he mentions key characters in there that were also alive at the time. Uh, this is one bit I missed mentioning. Sorry, I'll mention it now. Is when you're studying the Sira as you progress on in your early study of the Sira. You're going to get characters enter. It's 
absolutely imperative that you at that same time stop what you're doing and study their lives as well mm -hmm. because they grew with Rasulullah right and they have a huge part to play and it's not one saying I'm going to go through the whole seerah and then now I finish the seerah and oh yeah uh, what was uh, Abdullah ibn Masood's life in uh, what was his role in uh, the seerah and post seerah mm -hmm. right you can only like for example the, the argument a soul develops from these characters Right, so the Hanafi school, which is based on a lot of the understanding of, of the, uh, Abdullah ibn Masood, that was sent to Kufa. Yeah, was sent, sent to Kufa. So if and and like like I've had people rubbish him, totally rubbish him, and say, "Oh, I've got a Sahih Hadith here, and I don't want to listen to what he's saying." Right, but had you known who he was in the time of Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, right? Uh, how intimate his connection was, how a 30, you know, like like 23 years non-stop, he was known as he was known as the, the keeper of the, the cushion and the sandals. Right? And and the keeper of the cushion and the sandals is someone that has to be there all the time. It's not a case of okay, Rasulism stands stood up now and he's like, okay, uh, where are my sandals? Oh yeah, uh, uh, oh prophet, he's coming. Give five minutes. Yeah. And you know he has to be there at that time, right? So he saw everything. So when he is telling you this is how Rasulism prayed, you have to believe what this guy is saying, right? Over a hadith that's sahih where you could give a different meaning to, right? So that's why any character that enters. That's how you get the circles. You got the you got the four friends. Then you get the ten promised paradise. Mm -hmm. Then you get because there's rankings of Sahaba, right? Absolutely. And and a lot of these Sahaba then go on to play key roles in military history, in conquest, and in establishing empires later on, right? So then when you like, for example, in the the Umayyad controversy, half of that controversy goes away had you known their characters right from the early days, right? So that's very 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 important. Uh, like, for example, az Zuhri, you know, the, the political claim, oh, he was, because he was working under the emperor of the Umayyads, you've got to take his hadith with a pinch of salt. No, that's incorrect. You know, he's someone that you can absolutely trust. It doesn't matter if he's working under the emperor of, of the Umayyads. He wasn't, he wasn't a, a, a dollar for, a scholar for dollar, dirham or whatever it was at that time. So these kind of things. But that point, yeah, back to the book. So his book, Barnaby, you can, you can Google it. Muhammad, he's a non-Muslim, but he's wrote that with so much love and care, right? You know, you can, you can almost feel like this is a Muslim writing. You know, that's how beautiful. And there's a point there which will make you cry, which I learned from. So, and I've never seen this in a Muslim book. So he writes the seerah as a normal narrative. And then in the middle, he stops and takes a break and moves back. And then he goes on to, dis he's, you know, it's like it almost makes you think. So we've been discussing this figure for so long, but we're, we're looking around him, not at him. We're looking at his actions. Let's take, a, let's step back and sit down and let's look at this figure. Shh, who is this figure? Did we even look at him, know who he was? And then he goes on to describe in beautiful prose in two pages everything that we know about Rasulullah. And he ends it as a non Muslim, he ends it with Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Subhanallah. He's not a Muslim, but he ended it like that. And that for me was like, wow. You know, I've never seen a, a Muslim do that. And you know, inshallah, I have a plan to write to write the seerah, inshallah. I'm gathering inshallah. resources. And that's exactly what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna move away from the, the you know the 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 greater narrative and take a back seat for a while and just focus on the man, the man Muhammad, not the Prophet and his mission, the man Muhammad. Right, and uh, that's another seerah. And then there's another one. Uh, this is written by uh, a Pakistani or Indian scholar. So it's called Siratul Mustafa. It's a three-part series, and it goes into analysis, the all-important analysis. He breaks down things and analyzes them like nobody else does. It's by somebody called Molana Muhammad Idris Kadalwi. Kandalwi, yeah. So Siratul Mustafa is a three-part series. So then there's Ma there's Martin Links, and then there's a, a there's a historian Muslim academic. His name is Joel Haywood. Have you heard of him? Never heard of him before. Right, I've got his book here. This is one of his books. Here, this is this is the just is the Warrior Prophet. There, can you see the name? Yes, very clearly. Yeah, the Warrior Prophet. So in here, he's just talking about Rasulullah as a warrior. Know. And he wrote another book uh, on the same theme, like the 
the statesman prophet i don't know like he's he's written another one and and these books he spent sometimes a decade writing a decade right he said he would write and then revise and then write and then revise and sometimes do away with and start from scratch again right and he says he says as a historian he's an historian he's a muslim he says number one he goes i love my prophet without a doubt i'm a man of faith he goes but all too often when you look at any muslim source about any event for them it's all divine hand and it had to happen and that's it yeah but he goes not not one of them is looking at Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam as the man Allah. and his own decisions so and like his analysis because he's, he goes i'm he goes i am bound by the the, the laws of my profession i.e. history so i have to analyze i have to criticize i have to ask those all important questions before drawing conclusions Right. And and his analysis. I mean, if you're a historian, you're going to absolutely love this book. So it sounds already books. very interesting. Yes. Yeah. You, it sounds you very. Know. It sounds very very. Uh, from a from an academic perspective. Like he's yeah. Of... So just well, what, one last thing I want to say on this book. So he mentions in the first in the preamble he mentions there all the mistakes and he's given quotes of the books. So if you want to know the weaknesses of each book, he's mentioned in here. He mentions the mistakes they've made, the blunders they've made in analyzing the the. Rasulullah and he says partly because they were didn't have the the the, the knowledge of prehistory or of war. So Muhammad Hamidullah, right? He he was a he was a academic, a Pakistani academic who lived in France, Indian academic who lived in France and died at the age of eighty something in France. I think about twenty years ago. He's he's wrote he's he's wrote a book on the wars of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. An excellent excellent job, excellent analysis. But because he's not a war historian he's fallen short on a few places and he's mentioned them in this book and he says he says some of the blunders and he quotes the books he says that in the battle of badr rasul sallam was making a line he got everybody to make a line right like you know like the ranks and one one uh, bless the scholar who wrote the sira he says this was the first time in history that a line had been made and we see these tactics in the second world war and then the first okay. world war <laughs> we can see the embellishment already. Yes, yes. We are and he tell. says he says making lines is as old, is as old as history itself. It's a tactic of war. Right? Well, we find so in the Quran it's... even you know when uh, Sulaiman alayhi salam gets the men to he misses one bird when he's reviewing the formation oh. of his soldiers. It's written in the Quran, but these are, these are the embellishments that make a narrative, a general narrative, suspicious now because now we think well, Muslims and Islamic history. Can really trust as you mentioned all the embellishments. Yeah. But when you asked one of your questions was, is that why the embellishments, right? Why the embellishments? Well, put it this way. So if I'm teaching, if I'm sitting in a class of hadith studies, it's a very dry, very boring subject to many people, and the teacher's going to teach it in an academic way that's going to be very boring. He's not going to be saying, oh, wow, well, this hadith, you know, this is the narration. Look at the generation. One, two, three. Oh, it's cut off. It's munkati. Oh, my God. None of that. He's going to be speaking in a calm, dry, boring way. Now, imagine me teaching the seerah. And I'm like, oh, well, uh, you know, in the Battle of Badr, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, told Ali to go and fight Walid. And he killed Walid. And then the battle started. It's boring. Right. So but if you turn around and embellish it now. Uh, the three warriors from the other side came on and then Rasulullah Sallam said, you, you, you. And there were three Ansaris, go forward. And then uh, uh, Utba, one of them said, no, we've got no beef with you. Go back. We want our own. So then Rasulullah Sallam said, our own? Our own is my family. Hamza, Ali, I think it was Ubaidah. Yeah. Go forward. And Ali is 22 years of age, untested, untried, a boy. And everybody's shocked thinking, Messenger of Allah وسلم, said, Ali, Ali, Ali is a boy. And Ali goes forward and he's thinking in his heart, Oh my God, I've got a great weight on my shoulders. It's the Messenger of Allah who told me to go forward. He knows what I'm capable of and I have to prove and I have to deliver and I cannot lose. I'm representing Islam, I'm representing Bani Hashim, right? And then the embellishment now. So Ali goes forward and he stands square to square with Walid and he says, Oh, Walid. Draw your sword first and strike first, lest your sister cries tomorrow that I took an unfair advantage. This is the embellishment you mm -hmm. get in the books, right? So then Walid takes his sword out, strikes Ali. Ali, with the same blow, strikes, parries his sword, and then second slice kills him. And there's a, 
ghastly silence from both camps. Ali, Ali, Ali did this. And Ali is there and he looks back. He's got his hands in the air. He turns back to Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. I delivered, right? I delivered, right? And the Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam smiles and nods. You know what I'm saying? Right? It so is these, a dramatic effect. It has to be. Yeah. Of, of course. But right? it has and, and this is what the crowd needs. This is mm. the, the, the everyday, the storytellers in the taverns, in the in, in the coffee houses, in the mosques, in the in the gatherings who want some money that you've they tell you are part of a story and, and, and it's so arousing and so passionate. This is what the everyday man needed. The everyday man wasn't in the mosque learning hadith, <laughs> right? He was learning these stories in these embellishments. Right, and there was no one to challenge them. That what are you teaching? How are you teaching it? Mm. And we inherited it as a narrative, as we have today. Mm. Thank you so much. It's been really an amazing discussion, and I think it's something that we need more of. You know, we need more of these kind of thought-inspiring discussions. And when we talk of the Sira, it's more than just it's not a story. Okay, it is literally a journey. And I think, uh, as part of our experience as Muslims, we should embark upon the journey regularly but from different perspectives, different angles. And uh, if I can take anything away from this discussion is that uh, we shouldn't be quick to essentialize a message <clears throat> without looking at the preamble to the message, yeah? looking at the history to the message. The roots also matter as much as the fruit that come out of the tree. But also we shouldn't be afraid to ask questions. You know, If something in a narrative within the realms of history, that is in historiography, doesn't make sense, we should want to find out why. You began by saying you you sometimes cannot sleep until you've asked yourself, you've questioned or sought the answer to a question. It is a good habit to fall into because effectively you're exercising your mind, you know, you're inquiring. And that pursuit actually is not because of suspicion, it's love of truth. We are pursuing the truth, right? So uh, it's an amazing way to actually exercise our critical capacity, but also to seek the truth, you know, through the zero in the company of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Thank you. It's very easy for any Islamic sheikh giving a lecture who doesn't know his history to say, oh yeah, blank canvas, everything was blank. So I'm going to tell you how it was. It started with Nabuwa, uh, the birth of the Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and the 40 years of paganism. Then boom, Islam hit and light. That's it. It's very... Uh, so there was nothing in Arabia. This was a backward, backwater, complete barbaric society they were killing daughters they had nothing going for them maybe they were a bit kind of um, they knew poetry they're good to guess they were chivalrous but aside from that there's no civilization these people are not civilized at all would that be a well fair? they would they would have you believe that the only two redeeming qualities that the arabs had was one was their poetry and the second was their generosity and nobility that was it yes. right yes. so there was nothing there there was no prior civilization had they only read uh, Roman and Greek uh, historical texts, and they would have known how much of a civilization there was actually there in those areas. So, um, you know, it's like the antithesis. So, you know, we are Muslims, we are people of light, and the exact opposite of us was darkness, barbarianism, jahiliya, ignorance, you know, eating of carrion and killing, which I still haven't understood, by the way, eating of carrion. Uh, and uh, um, burying our daughters, which wasn't as widespread as they would have you believe, and all, all of these sort of things. So it's a very, it's a, it's a quick brush, you know, to kind of wash away what you don't know and say, okay, well, now listen to what I do know, which is the narrative of the Sira, which is only on the religious level.